Good morning again. I'm Ahmed Fauzi and I'm with you here from the Peace One Day offices in Richmond in the United Kingdom. You should see the ener energy around here on Peace Day. Uh, we have a, a full day of programming for you, uh, talks, uh, interviews, uh, dance and music. We'll be talking about the power of the individual. We'll be talking about grassroots activism, coalitions and corporations. They all have a role to play and you have a role to play too in Peace Day. This is Peace Day 2016. Our next segment, this is program three, we heard from the United Nations, Maher Nasser and Melissa Fleming, and we screened the first Peace One Day video for you, the, pardon me, not video, but feature documentary film, award-winning film that's been shown all over the world. If you had a chance to view it, I hope you enjoyed it and that uh, it told you the story of the creation of the first ever fixed day in the UN calendar about uh, more than 15 years ago um, and the journey that uh, Jeremy Gilley and his team went on to create that day. Quite a journey. Uh, we're not done yet. It's going to be a long day. We're going to hear now from the producers of those uh, uh, feature documentaries, Peace One Day and The Day After Peace, which, uh, after Peace, which we'll be screening later on today. John Batsek and Nick Fraser. First, John Batsek who is an Oscar-winning producer uh, for, I believe it was, One Day in September. Yes, One Day in September about the Munich Olympics. We uh, will listen to him, and then later we'll listen to Nick Fraser. So let's roll that interview with John Batsek. Uh, my name is John Batsek. I run uh, an independent documentary production company called Passion Pictures, which I've been running with my great friend Andrew Ruman for the past 20 years. And I guess we, we have become a specialist in making theatrical feature documentaries. Um, started with a film called One Day in September about the Munich Olympics. Most recently, last year, we made a film called Listen to Me, Marlon, about Marlon Brando. And in between, we've made, in, in between those two films, we've made... 50, 60 odd movies. I'm a veteran, they call me now, which is a bit depressing. I'm a veteran documentary producer um, at probably the most prolific documentary production company in this country. There are many things that I love about producing documentaries. I, I suppose most notably it's the fact that there's something incredibly rewarding about telling true stories, about getting to the real, honest heart of a story. More often than not, we're telling quite tragic, often very important, very dramatic stories. And, and, and hearing the real story come out of the mouths of the people who really experienced the, the story that you're telling is just an incredibly powerful experience. And I've, no, and I've found that audiences respond in a similar way. They find it very affecting, very emotional, and ultimately, you know, I've, I've, I've been lucky enough to have many experiences where I, I, I get to see both audiences respond to these stories and also the people whose stories we've told react to the way that we've told them. And in, in almost every case, if not in every case, the effect that the making of these stories has had on the various people is so extraordinary and, and always in a sort of positive, beneficial way that it's... I can't think of a better reward for the end of, of the work that you do than to get that sort of reaction. So it's, it's a sort of, and, and until you do it, you can't quite understand how amazing it is. And, and, and I think what's kind of interesting about that, it's not about money, it's not about glory, it's not about any of, it's about, as I said, that sort of the rewards of being as authentic as you possibly can, being as honest as you possibly can in, in terms of storytelling, and it's, it's, it never ceases to be a pleasure. The other thing I love about making documentaries is that it's a sort of, it's the ultimate form of teamwork. And, you know, I love that aspect of, of what we do. It's, there's a sort of, there's a, an inner core of people with whom I collaborate and, and collectively we make these films. And there's just something wonderful about that sort of team spirit ethic of making docs. I mean, the kind of stories that inspire me 
you know, they, 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 they're invariably about, actually they're invariably about ordinary people behaving extraordinarily. You know, that's something that I find, I never cease to find inspiring. You know, we, tell, we tend to tell stories about people who are just like you and I, who behave, behave in a way that I could never imagine behaving. And in some respects, there's something incredibly inspiring about that, you know, because, because it's not like these people are extraordinary so that you can sort of distance yourself from them. Often they are, as I said, they're, they're no different from you and I. Um, in many cases, they're far less privileged than, or, than someone like me. And yet they behave in a way that I would dream that I had the bravery and the courage to behave that way. And then also I get the chance to tell many stories that have the backdrop of sport. And I'm a sports nut. And so that's always a great pleasure. So, so I've, got to, I've got to make some stories about people that I, I respect and admire tremendously um, who have been involved through the nature of what they do sports-wise in of in dramatic and triumphant experiences and that's always great fun why did i decide to produce the first peace one day documentary i didn't decide to produce the first peace one day documentary jeremy decided that i was going to produce the first peace one day documentary i'm pretty sure i remember him calling me up out of the blue and saying this is who I am, this is what I want to do, can I come and see you? To which I, as politely as I could, said, no, you can't come and see me. And then he came and saw me. Uh, and I, I also remember pretty clearly thinking, okay, I'm definitely not gonna help this guy because I don't have the time and I don't really know what he wants and I'm not sure I really believe him. And he's definitely gotta cut that ponytail off or I'm not gonna be able to take him seriously. And he did come to see me and I'm sure I did say no and then I produced the film. Um, you know, uh, Jeremy from day one was as passionate and committed as he is today. Maybe that's not fair. Maybe he's a thousand times more passionate and committed today, but he couldn't have been much more passionate and committed than when I first met him. And I, you know, I mean, at the heart of what Jeremy was trying to do then and what he has established now was something that I felt, why wouldn't one want to help? You know, it's like, it's so easy to be cynical. It's so easy to say things like, he's got a ridiculous ponytail, I don't want to help the guy. But the truth is, what he was trying to do, particularly at the time that he was trying to do it, and when we were making that first film, I forget exactly the dates, but certainly 9-11 happened in the middle of film one, I seem to remember. You know, it's just too easy to be cynical, as I said, and go, this is ridiculous. And, and, and I didn't want to do that. I felt like it. It was something that, you know, as he used to say, and he probably still says, if three people took notice of it, then that's better than no one. And uh, so, you know, ultimately, I became very happy to help him as best I could. I mean, you know, I, I, I think the journey with Peace One Day Films is always driven by Jeremy. Jeremy's doing the vast amount of the work, the lion's share of the work. What I was doing, I, I feel like, you know, I just constantly wanted to provide whatever support I could. And often that was, can you connect me to this person? Can you connect me to that person? Can you help bring the BBC in? Or can you help find other international partners? Jay's very, he, he was very collaborative. You know, he wanted, he wanted to, he wants to learn from people who know more than him or know things in areas that he doesn't know. To be honest, the second film, I was, I, he, he drove even more than the first film in terms of the producing. And, and in, in some respects, I was, I was also always there to try and rein him in because he's that enthusiastic that, you know, to his credit, he can get carried away. And I think, you know, I know that, that, that for all that I could part my cynicism, most people can't and don't part their cynicism with this sort of thing. And I wanted to give him the best possible chance of not being able to be easily dismissed by those people who wanted to dismiss him. And so, you know, we had a, you know, and as you'll see in film one, the ponytail came off. Um, and, and, you know, it's that that's a fact. People react to that kind of thing. It's ridiculous, but they do. Um, so, you know, it was it was just... He's very easy to get on with, and um, you know, it was it was like a, a guy. I was sort of a, you know, a, a, a sort of guiding 
force through both those films, just trying to keep him focused and on the right path and, and to prevent him from from opening himself up to so much of the criticism that could come his way. And that does come his way. And it is, it's, it's a constant battle, I'm sure. Um, and more power to him that he keeps going and going and going. I mean, I, I felt like it was fanciful and foolish and naive and and at the same time, why not? I mean, where's the harm in it? If you establish a day of peace just by the very nature of establishing it, and of course in film one, I seem to remember it's a long time ago now, but the, the UN passed that resolution. Even if it stops there, what an amazing thing to have achieved out of a little home in Richmond or wherever the hell it was at the time. Um, you know, I, I, I was anxious that people wouldn't observe it. I was anxious that it wouldn't have a big effect. And, you know, to a certain extent, I remain concerned because I know it has had a profound effect globally. The world doesn't seem to be much safer to me, which is a great tragedy. But it's definitely better off for the existence of the Day of Peace. And, and, and so, you know, I, I, I applaud it and... As I said, if, if 10 people pay attention to it, then that's 10 more than if they didn't. And in that respect, we know millions of people have, have, have observed it and continue to observe it, and more do every year. And so the cynics can blather on all they want, uh, and the world can continue to be a tragically violent place. But there's a day of peace, and some in places around the world, some people stop killing each other on that day. So who could possibly knock that? I mean, I'd encourage everyone on Peace Day to do whatever they possibly can to promote the concept of peace on that day and on every day if possible. So, yeah, take to the streets, make films, write songs, write poems, write letters, you know, make peace with someone that you've been warring with, you know, whatever possibly can be done on that day. And as I said, I don't know why it needs to be limited to that day. On um, whatever day you possibly can to just, you know, the world is a terrible, terrible mess. More than I can ever remember it. Having not lived through a world war, you know, I, I've never felt less safe. Whatever anyone can be doing to be promoting the concept of nonviolence, peace, I'm all for it. What an interesting man, John Batzak, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to listen to the next producer now of Jeremy's Peace Day Films, and his name is Nick Fraser. He is the executive producer of uh, the fi film you just saw, if you did see it, Peace One Day, and he's the editor of uh, the BBC documentary Strand Storyville. He's also the founder of Yaddo. Um, before we go into that, I I've just been informed that the International Day of Peace is trending worldwide on Twitter at the moment, which is great news, which means millions of people are now talking about peace and the International Day of Peace. And we do need peace in this a day and age, in this world of ours. I'm not going to go into all that now, but um, the other thing I'd like to acknowledge, recognize, uh, uh, is that Facebook has notified millions of its uh, members uh, w with their news feeds that today is Peace Day 2016. So great, Facebook is now also engaged. Social media platforms, two of the main social media platforms are engaged with Peace Day, which is great news. And I saw that they had their live stand in New York during the Global Summit on Refugees and Migrants. And it's great to have all this grassroots engagement in the International Day of Peace. Remember, you can make a difference. We're going to listen to Nick Fraser, who is the second major producer of the Peace One Day films uh, in a minute, in a second rather. I just wanted you to know this is around 10 to 13 minutes long. Let's roll that interview.
I wanted to be involved in the film because I really admired Jeremy. I thought it was astonishing that someone would get up one morning and say, I want to change the world, I have an idea about a day of peace. And I thought it was particularly remarkable because he came from totally, totally outside the sort of ring, the sort of circle of UN officials, of NGOs. He came from the outside, he was a citizen activist, and I really admired him. I think Jeremy should go on doing films. I think he should do films about other things because he's interested in so many things. But I think it's important there's a continuing record of what he's doing with Peace One Day. So yes, I think there should be more films. I don't really believe that film is a very efficient way of changing the world. And I got involved with Jeremy because I really liked him. I, I, I don't think that films shouldn't exist that try to change the world, but it's not what actually interests me at all. I'm interested in films that tell you about what a person is like, what a situation is like, what a historical event is like, the consequence of an idea, the consequence of an attitude. And I'm following Jeremy because of Jeremy, because I totally admire him and totally admire his commitment. But I, I remain sceptical um, in the face of many opponents, by the way, as to the possibility that film does actually change anything. It's very hard to change anything if you write, so why should it be any easier if you make a film? I think people should make documentaries for whatever reason they have to make documentaries. It's not my business to tell them what to do or how to make films. I'm really, really against that. But if you're asking me personally, all the films I love, including Jeremy's films, tell you this is what it's like. This is what it's really like. Do you want to know what it's really like? I'll tell you. I'm trying to write a book about why I like documentaries. I could envisage myself in life doing loads of other things, but I came across documentaries, and I think they reflect a number of interests of mine. I, I'm interested in photography as a lay person. I can't take any snaps myself. I'm interested in language. I'm interested in narrative. I'm interested in ideas. And documentaries are kind of wonderful, creative, massive road accident in which all these things collide and mysteriously don't destroy each other, but enhance each other. And I also think that the act of making a documentary is capable of transforming reality, that when you look at something hard enough, it becomes something special and something different because of the understanding you bring to looking at it. It's very hard for me to say I'm proudest of any story world because it's a wonderful kind of promiscuity that's afforded by looking after Storyville. You can fall in love and fall out of love with every film that you get involved in. Some of them don't quite work out. Some of the ones I care most about don't quite work out. But there are many, many unexpected successes. There are things that you think, oh, this is never going to work. Why did I ever do this? And it turns out to be a marvelous film. I also think many films are marvelous in bits and pieces. You can have a film that overall isn't quite a success, but it has two or three totally, totally wonderful scenes in it, and you're prepared to put up the rest of the film because of those scenes. Well, um, the first documentary I really loved was a documentary about French history that I went to see with my mother in 1969 called The Sorrow and the Pity. And for a long time, that was my kind of benchmark. It was what was telling me, you've got to go on, you've got to do something that's even a quarter as good as that, and then you might feel happy. But recently, I think I've um, changed my views somewhat. That I, The more I watch documentaries, the more I find out about them, and I was write this book, the more tolerance I become about wildly different documentaries. Um, 
of the shows I watched in the last three months, I think Paris is Burning is the most astonishing film. It's a, it's a film in which I imagine everyone by now has died in the film because it's a film about voguing, about dancing in Prieds Harlem in New York. And there's wonderful um, master of ceremonies. There are wonderful characters in the film. And you pray that the people will survive, even as you know, because of AIDS, that they probably didn't. Um, another film I watched called Stories We Tell is the most beautiful film about an improbable subject, which is discovering who your father really was in a middle-class bohemian Toronto and Montreal background that you might say is likely to produce an extremely dull film, but every single minute by Sarah Polly, who's a very good Canadian actor, is wonderful. I watched um, over the last week and wrote about Shoah, which is a nine-hour long film about, yes, about the Sonder Command, about the Holocaust. It means extinction in Hebrew, Shoah, and it really, really, it didn't change the world. It changed how the world looked at atrocity, how the world looked at the Holocaust. It's by a maniac called Claude Lanzmann, who's 90, he's still alive. I've met him a couple of times. He threw me out of his office once because he thought I had the wrong attitude towards covering evil people. And the film is sublime, horrifying and sublime. I don't want to watch it for another decade because it's too tough. But every minute I was watching it, sitting at home, I thought, this is extraordinary. This is really what documentary film can do. And his method of interviewing people is always to ask them to describe things. When they hesitate, he'll say, you must go on. he say, you must go on. We want you to go on. Can you really tell me what it was like? Can you really say what it was like so that we can be there and we can understand it? And in the end, you do understand. I'm not sure film is educational. It's certainly educative, if you can make that distinction. It's not pedantic, because it gets you to look at what things really are. I think what you do with that knowledge afterwards is your own problem. It's your own solution. I think, you know, if you're told about horrors, you're told about this, told about that, it frees you as a citizen to be intelligent and to make a decision out of your own sense of responsibility. If you have no sense of responsibility, if you're closed off to reality and closed off to what the film is telling you, then you're not going to do anything at all. I'm skeptical about films that have a preordained message. The reason I'm skeptical about this is that I, I think it's a misuse of the medium. I think even more than language, film is about what happens. And if you've decided what's going to happen in your film, your film is not really about what happens. It's, it's, it's a kind of predigestion of what you think is going to happen or did happen. So I think film has to be film, and it has to look at things in the way people look at things. And I think that's a clue why I like documentary films so much, because I spend my whole time reading about things that have happened. And when I see a really good film, it's about something that is happening. The fact that Jeremy can't plan ahead gives his films a wonderful spontaneity. They're, they're not message films, they're Jeremy films. And they, they reproduce his anarchic sense and his sense of obligations, and that's why they're so watchable. I think Jeremy is a campaigner. I think he runs great campaigns, and I think his films serve his campaigns. In most instances, I wouldn't be interested in films like that, but I love them because Jeremy is such a great person. Yaddo is very simple. It's an online global platform where by paying a small amount of money, you can watch a large number of documentaries when you want. We choose the documentaries. We ensure that the documentaries you find on Yaddo are really good. And wherever you are in the world, within four months, you'll be able to go to Yaddo in China, in Russia, in Australia, Africa, wherever. You'll be able to go into Yaddo and look at many documentaries and enjoy them. And that's the point of Yaddo. And it's 
I think it's the future of documentaries. I think it's harder and harder to find out where the good documentaries are. They're all over the place. Some of them are on YouTube. They'll appear on the BBC. They may be on for a bit on the BBC iPlayer. They may be on other public broadcasters' iPlayers. They're not aggregated. They're not present in one place. And nobody tells you at the moment, you've got to watch this. It's a really great film. And that's what I'll be doing for Yaddo, telling people, well, I think you should watch this. Why don't you give this a try? Yaddo will be available by the time you show this, i.e. next Friday. Well, at the moment, in Yaddo, we're working on three different films. One film is about the life cycle of a pig. It's about the relationship between humans and pigs. It's called Oink. And essentially, it's an ecological film about the economics of the pig, how the pig is an industry, how we you know, disregard these highly intelligent animals in order to turn them into byproducts that we then consume. And it also examines the way humans view pigs. Like, do we love them or do we make fun of them or are we afraid of them? And you've got a lot of literature from Animal Farm through the cartoon novel Mouse, or wherever you look, or, or the Black Panthers indeed, calling policemen pigs. There's, there's a kind of abusive relationship that humans have with these delightful animals who create food for them. I want to say that I really admire Jeremy and I think Peace One Day is a great initiative and if the world had more Jeremy's, the world would be a better place because it would be more full with passionate people who get up one morning and decide that um, pessimism and cynicism notwithstanding they wish to do something and in Jeremy's case they do. What a man, uh, uh, beyond doubt, one of the world's top uh, documentary producers, Nick Fraser, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Fraser. And we heard from John Batsek as well uh, before, the two key producers with Jeremy Gilly on the Peace Day films, Peace One Day and the Day After Peace, which we will be seeing during the course of the day today in about uh, two hours. So if you have time, clear the decks, sit down, get the popcorn and the soft drinks, It'll be um, something to watch, the day after peace, and remember Jude Law is in that too. Um, I did want to say that uh, Peace One Day and Jeremy Gilly are launching into their third film tomorrow. So you heard it on Facebook Live first. They're going to start their third major production, and it's going to be quite something, I think, even more dramatic than the first so thanks to uh, Nick and John for those extremely interesting interviews. And uh, I'd like to uh, remind you that if you've missed anything, you can watch it on the uh, Peace One Day YouTube channel. And don't forget to comment on this show on Facebook and tell your friends about it. Um, our next program, which will be program four, will talk about coalitions. And we'll be meeting a wonderful, two wonderful women, Pamela Zabala who is the head of Women and Children's Services at Hestia, Hestia. Um, and Kieran Bally, who is the Global Council Chairperson of United Religions Initiative. Uh, don't forget, today is the day to reach out to people, to say you're sorry, it ain't difficult, and to celebrate Peace Day. There's plenty of time to make peace today with your friends, with your neighbours, with your family. We're going to take a pause now from all of us here. Thank you for watching and a big thank you to our guests, John Batzek and Nick Fraser in this program. Um, that was our first peace talk. We have five peace, peace talks during the day today. More about that later, but we'll be back very, very soon. Program four, four coming up in about 10 minutes. Thank you.